Uh, my name's Jake Fowler. I'm a user experience designer on the Fusion team, and this is gonna be surface modeling under the hood. Uh, that's me. Um, I am a UX designer, so that means I design kind of the tools and the UI and the interactions that we have inside of Fusion 360. I mostly focus on the modeling and drawings environments, as well as the overall kind of UI platform. Uh, things like the new toolbar and the, the tab bar that we have now, um, I was partly responsible for that work. Um, been at Autodesk for about 13 years, on the Fusion team for half of that. Uh, previously worked on Inventor for a little bit, and ASM, which is kind of the modeling kernel that drives the geometry we create in, in Fusion and other software at Autodesk. Um, yeah, so this is kind of what I do. This is my day-to-day, -day, is like building specs and designing how UI looks and feels, and then giving this to our development team so they flesh that out into the software that you guys use every day. Okay, so more importantly about this session. Um, this is gonna be a session that hopefully gives you an understanding of the underlying technology that's behind our surfacing tool set. Um, and then we're gonna try and use that knowledge to um, build better models essentially. You know, understand what's going on under the hood and then use those uh, pieces of information to follow better surfacing techniques and tackle common modeling problems. I should be using this clicker. Um, so the talk split into like three parts. I'm gonna start talking about splines in the sketching environment, then talk on uh, more about the surfacing tools, and then finish up with a few strategies for building successful <coughs> surface models. Okay, that's not working. Great. Um, okay, so I'll start with splines. Uh, so what are splines and why are they important in the, um, in the area of industrial design? So splines are kind of unique in that they allow, they allow us to describe changes in curvature. So if you think of like your basic sketching tools, things like lines and arcs, um, they're nice simple geometry, but they have a fixed curvature, right? A line is zero curvature and a spline um, has a constant curvature. Oh, sorry, an arc has a constant curvature. Splines let us describe transitions between those curve types. So if you're building smooth shapes, you need to use splines to build nice smooth transitions between objects. Um, you look at modern consumer product design, um, you know, this thing looks pretty simple. Looks like a box with some fillets on. Uh, but those are definitely not fillets, right? Um, the fillet tool is not designed for like aesthetically pleasing surfaces. It's more for engineering fillets. And, you know, Apple designers probably spent weeks like fine tuning some splines to, to make that corner there. So in Fusion, we have two tools for creating splines. We have fit point splines and control point splines. I'm gonna talk about those both. Um, I'm also gonna be using the curvature combs a lot because they're our tool for analyzing how smooth and how evenly curves flow. So this is a really important tool for analyzing um, the, the nature of the curves that you build. So to access this, you select a curve and you can apply this from the sketch palette. So I'll start with fit point splines. So fit point splines are splines that fit the points that you select. Um, the kind of old school kind of wooden spline equivalent of this, I guess, would be pegs that you used to constrain the spline. You put these pegs in and the spline fits those points that you selected. With fit point splines, basically the rule is the more points you add, the more control and the more um, complex shapes you can make with a spline. So here I have uh, two endpoints and a single point in the middle of the spline. If I right click and say, insert a new fit point there, um, I can select points on the spline to add new points and that's gonna give me the flexibility to describe more complex shapes, um, eventually. There we go, I should have sped up this GIF. Um, there we go, so adding more points gives you a bit more shape control. But as industrial designers, we wanna go for the smoothest curves possible. And um, the general rule with fit point splines is you don't always need to add these internal points. So here, I just have a start and an end point on this spline. And we're getting a lot of shape control with these handles that are underlying every spline point that you have on a fit point spline. So I selected those points, I have those handles, and as I drag those, it's adjusting the shape. And I'm getting a similar shape to what I had before with that internal point there. Um, the general rule of thumb is minimum points is best. Um, try to use the handles wherever possible. That's gonna give you the smoothest curves that you can get. Uh, in fact, when you're doing like simple curves with a single direction of curvature, you can probably achieve most of those with no internal points at all. Just two endpoints on the spine are gonna let you move the handles and get the shape that you want. Um, so in terms of like 
mastering splines. Uh, you know, when you're starting out with splines, the temptation is to go click, 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 and build points that trace the shape that you want. When you start to understand what's going on under the hood, you can see that there's wobbles in the curvature there. So this is not an ideal shape. Oops, skipped ahead. Um, uh, as you start to use splines a bit more, you learn that um, the fewer points, the better. And you can see here from that curvature comb that I'm getting a much better quality curve out of this input now. But really, for like true spline enlightenment, you want to have zero points if possible, right? Just have start and end points, use as handles, and you're going to be guaranteed a super high quality curve. So I'll jump into Fusion now and show quickly how you can do this in uh, 3D. Um, OK. Is everyone seeing? Uh, UI is kind of small. Sorry about that. Um, so these are some sketches I made of this mouse here. And we're going to sketch one of these curves in three dimensions. So I've got a side view and a top view that I've, I've laid in as canvases. So this curve that fades up here on the top view is, is this curve here. It's kind of like a, a beveled edge here. So I'm going to build that curve firstly on the ground plane and then pull it up into 3D to make that a 3D spline. So start at the top, make a new sketch on that ground plane. Uh, rotate it here so we can see it more easily. So fit point spline, I'm just going to pick the start and end points. Hit OK. And then you can see those handles. And now as I drag those handles, I'm able just to use this to achieve the shape that I want. So drag those out. This is a good time now to add those curvature combs to the shape. So selecting the curve, hitting the curvature comb tool here is giving me an analysis of that curve. And you can see that it's kind of like dipping a little bit there. That's probably not what I want. I just want a single direction of uh, curvature. So if I tweak this a bit more, I'm going to get eventually a smoother shape. You know, you can spend hours fine tuning these things, but that'll do for now. So now that's the shape I want, but it's just sitting on the ground plane. So in order to move a, a curve into 3D, the easiest way to do that is using the move tool. So as I go into this side view now, I can see I'm looking at that spline kind of edge on. I hit M to open the move command, and then just picking the endpoints of the spline and dragging them into the correct locations in 3D. I can start to make this a 3D spline that matches my design intent. Um, so those endpoints are in place now. I need to do the same thing with the handles. Oops. Um, I think I accidentally selected the whole handle there. So just that point. There we go. Um, so that's already looking pretty good there. Um, now when I pan around, you can see that this is now, because I just moved things in the Z direction, I didn't move points in X or Y. That's matching what I had originally on that view, but I've also described that shape in 3D as well. Um, you can see that it's like not quite planar. I think that's how it is on the original product. But um, if you wanted to planarize this curve, you would then make a plane that kind of approximately passes through this and then project the curve there would give you that planar version if that's what the design intent was. But this looks pretty good here. OK, so that was fit point splines. Um, control point splines are described a little bit differently. So fit points fit on the curve itself. Control points are kind of like these weights that tug on the spine and add a bit of tension in the area that you add those points. So again, the kind of same rules apply, which is fewer points is better. Um, but you need to add points to get more shape control. And control points are a bit different. They're more like handles, less like fit points. So you can freely add uh, control points to a control point spline up to a certain number. Um, Five or six is usually the maximum before you start impacting the quality of the curve. But you can continue at points, and because there's no handles here, you really need to add more points to get more shape control. So control points are a little bit less bad, I guess, to add than uh, fit points. Um, the important thing to know about control point splines, though, is that you want those points to flow smoothly and evenly. Um, so we have three curves here that look pretty similar, looking at the blue curves. But you can see from the... Um, the, the way I've placed the control points there, that there's some uneven spacing in that top example, and then some zigzagging in that bottom example. So even though the, the smooth curves kind of look pretty similar, you put the curvature combs on there, and you realize that those imperfections in the flow is causing some waviness in the curvature of that spline. So really, you want to be aiming for nice, even spacing between the points and a natural flow, rather than this uh, zig zigzagging here. OK, so I'll do what I did for the fit point spline. I'll show an example now of how to build a control point spline in 3D. Simply rotate around here, and I'll build this curve here, which corresponds to this lower curve 
in this view. So I'll make another sketch. Actually, I'll hide that previous sketch so it doesn't distract us. Uh, rotate this round. Um, so here's the control point spline tool. Um, if I just pick two points here, it's not going to be something I can really work with. It's just a straight line at that point. So I'm going to start with three points as the minimum number that can describe the curve. And you can see I've already pretty closely matched that. Um, moving this point around is going to tweak that to get the shape I want. Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing, go to this view, hit the Move tool, and start to move these points into 3D to form that 3D shape. Um, so again, there's no handles this time, so this is a little bit easier to manage. Um, as I get up here, you're going to see that I'm a bit limited in what I can do in this area, right? I'm, I'm matching it around here, but I'm too high here, and vice versa. If I pull it down, I'm not able to describe this shape with the number of points I have here. So this is where it's useful to add additional points. So hit OK. Right click and say insert spline, uh, control point. If I click now, you see that it's going to add points kind of either side of the one I originally had. So when you insert a point into a control point spline, it's trying to keep the smooth shape as it is and just moving the control frame to adjust that. So do that now, and those points are in different locations, but that, that spline has stayed in the same place, which is really useful, so I didn't lose that stuff I did earlier on. So I'm gonna do the same thing, move this around a little bit, tweak the shape until it matches the design intent, and there you go. Um, yeah, that's how control point splines work. Oh, have a question? The fill point splines. Um, they're the same in that you can do it. If it's lying on a 2D plane, you can apply constraints. Today, once it's in 3D, um, we can't accurately apply like constraints in three dimensions. That's oh, you can lock it in place. So that's that's a good point. You can. I think the fixed constraint will work here. So I can select that spline and fix it in place. To be honest, once it's in 3D, um, we're not solving it in the same way. It's not going to move around in the same way that stuff on the 2D plane would would move around. Cool. Um, nice. OK. So yeah, those are the two splines we have in Fusion. Um, it's often a case of personal preference, which one you use for given situations. Um, here are the kind of the, what I see as the kind of pros and cons of each type. So control point splines give you a bit more nuanced control over the shape. Um, and they give you a cleaner understanding of what the math is behind that. Fit point splines are less kind of give you less accurate control in that sense, but they're definitely easier to use because the points are directly on the spline, so it's a more intuitive way to describe shapes. Um, so here's typically how I use either one of these curves. For kind of primary surfaces when I'm building models, I'll use those control point splines to have nice smooth control over the underlying math of those curves. Um, the fit point splines are really good for when you're building a curve that blends two shapes together because those handles are really nice for adjusting that shape in three dimensions. Um, I also use fit point splines if I'm doing detail work, kind of like tracing a logo or something. Because of that direct control, it's a lot easier to do that with a, with a fit point spline. Okay, so that's how you build individual curves. The important next step is connecting them together smoothly. Uh, so how many people here are familiar with terms, you know, G1, G2? Is that something everyone's worked with before? Okay, like half of us, that's good. So I'll go through a quick like primer of what those mean and how to determine those types of connections. Um, so we describe the relationship between two connected things by their continuity, uh, which is basically how similar the shape is at that meeting point. So to analyze that, we use those curvature combs on the uh, splines. Once you make surfaces from that, you can use the zebra analysis from the inspect panel to analyze what's it gonna look like when light reflects off of those surfaces. And that's what the zebra stripes are telling you. So a G0 connection is the most basic way you can connect two things. And that just means they're touching, but there's no correlation there. The surfaces are pointing in different directions at that point. So when the curvature comes, you'll see this as a gap between the two combs there. And on the surface, um, you'll see that the zebra stripes don't seem to have any correlation. They don't match up at all. Uh, and that's going to result in an edge that's sharp on the model, which is obviously sometimes you want. But if we're going for smoothness, we need to apply more constraints. So a G1 connection is a tangent connection. That's where the surfaces have the same direction, but they have different curvatures, basically different radius at that point. So this curve has a smaller, sorry, a larger radius, so a smaller curvature of this area versus this curve. So you'll see this on the combs as they're pointing in the same direction, but they're of different lengths. And 
uh, when you look at the zebra stripes, they're gonna match up, but there's gonna be like a sharp bend in them. Um, and what that is, is it's showing you how light is gonna reflect off this surface. So if you uh, build a surface like this and actually manufactured it, you would see that sharp bend in the light reflections. So it's kind of smooth feeling, but it's gonna look like a kind of sharp edge on the model. Um, this is fine for like small fillets and small details, but when you're building kind of like very obvious transitions on the A side of your models, um, you're gonna wanna avoid this kind of effect here. So G2 is kind of the, what you should be going for if you're building aesthetically smooth blends. So G2 is uh, the curves or surfaces having both the same direction and the same curvature at that meeting point. So on the combs, that's represented by them touching. If you see those red lines, if they're touching, that means it's a G2 connection. Um, if you look at the zebra stripes, they're gonna flow smoothly around there, so that reflects how light is gonna bounce off of that surface. So this is both a, a smooth looking and a smooth feeling surface. So this is kind of what you should be aiming for. When we talk about this, the question comes up is like, well, that doesn't look good, right? That kink in the red thing. Um, so what is this? So that doesn't represent a visual kink in the surface. It's kind of like one level deeper than that. It's kind of a, in mathematical terms, I think it's a derivative of the, the problem. It's not the problem itself. So this is not gonna be a visual kink in the surface, uh, but it does mean that the curvature suddenly changes um, at that point. And so that's, for kind of this kind of thing, like you're not really gonna notice. I think this is something that automotive designers and things worry about because they're building big, shiny objects. And so these kind of imperfections are a lot more obvious when you're dealing with those kind of products. So G2 is gonna be fine for most consumer product design, but if you wanna kind of be a master at this, you can go for G3, which doesn't have a constraint, we don't have a name, so I'm just calling it ultra smooth. Um, so the technical definition here is that it's not only the same curvature at that point, it's the rate of change of curvature is the same there. Um, so if you get that red line smooth or nearly smooth, uh, that's gonna result in a G3 connection that there's gonna be no perceptible break, the zebra stripes just flow as if it was a single connected surface. Um, yeah, and it's gonna feel like there's no edge whatsoever there. So let's have a little demo and see if we can achieve something like that G3 connection we just saw. So I'm gonna to switch to uh, this example here, just a side view of a toaster. So we're gonna try and make this the sexiest toaster ever. Um, so let me go and edit this sketch. And I'm gonna try and start by building a blend curve. As I said, I find fit point splines kind of easier for describing blend curves. So I'm just gonna do the same thing I did before, connect the spline to those two points. Oops, I did the escape thing. Um, try again, hit enter and then just apply a curvature constraint at either of those ends. So that's a nice blend now. That's gonna be guaranteed to be G2, um, but not necessarily G3. Something you'll notice here is if I go and try and edit those points now, it's impacting those primary curves that I already had there, um, which is not what you want. Uh, the reason for this is just the way our sketches kind of solve in the background. So as you make changes, it doesn't have a sense of like this curve is more important than this curve or something like that. It's just solving everything together. So the kind of workaround I've developed for this um, behavior is to build my transition curves in a separate sketch to the original curves. So I'm gonna start a new sketch on that same plane. And I can do exactly the same thing, but what this means is in the timeline I have a before sketch and an after sketch. And anything I do in the after sketch is not gonna change what's in the before sketch. So I can do exactly the same thing. What this is doing behind the scenes is projecting those curves into this new sketch. So I can still refer to them, but it's not gonna change anything about them. So I'm gonna do that again, that curvature constraint here. But now if I select this curve and I do the same thing of like pulling those handles. So select one, start the move tool. You can see those primary curves are not gonna change at all as I do this. So that's a nice um, way to describe so force fusion to think in this kind of parent-child relationship between curves. Okay, let me tweak this one as well. Um, you can drag these, but I sometimes find it useful to open the move tool and just drag this planar slider. It seems to give me more smooth motion. Um, okay, so that's looking roughly like what I had. If I now select those three and apply curvature combs, I can analyze how, uh, how they look underneath. So one, two, three. You can also add curvature combs from the right-click menu when you select curves, say toggle curvature display, and it does the same thing. Okay, so that is showing me that the curvature dramatically increases here, which is what I expect, because it's getting sharper. Um, 
but it's giving me that sharp connection there. So it's, it's G2, it is smooth, but it's not that kind of flowing G3 that we saw on that last slide. So the general rule of thumb is if you want to go for that kind of G3 connectivity, you need to give a bit of runway to your transition curves. Um, so here I'm kind of ended pretty abruptly at the end of those flat regions. So there's no runway for this high curvature region to flow into this area here. So I'm going to, um, actually I'll leave those on. I'll finish the sketch and now as I drag these points, this is going to edit that original sketch and my transition curves should update. So I pull that in place. So I pull these away now. Um, that's going to give me a bit more runway to achieve that kind of G3 connectivity that we saw. I'm just tweaking the points here to uh, match that shape that I had previously. I don't know why that's freaking out. Okay. So now I have that same connection, but I have more runway now and I can adjust those handles and I should be able to achieve something more like that G3. So I edit the sketch again. Select that handle and move it. And you can see now I can start to approximate a smooth connection there. So it's not quite there up there, but it's looking pretty good down here. So this is how you achieve those smooth transitions is to pull the primary curves further away than you might expect from that transition. So now if I do a simple uh, surface extrude of this, we should be able to see what the surface would look like. Um, try that again. Select those three curves. Okay. And as I say, to analyze this on a surface, you go to inspect, use the zebra analysis tool. And that is going to be, oh, come back. Um, yeah, that's going to be a very smooth connection. I could tweak that and get it further, but that's going to be exactly what you want from a, a G3-like connection in Fusion. So general rule of, of uh, thumb for splines, always use the minimum number of points possible for either spline type. Um, oh, sorry, quick question. Hmm. Yeah, so we, we, yeah, it's, right, so uh, surfacing tools like Alias that are designed for the automotive industry will have a G3 connection. Um, we don't have that in Fusion today because typically the things you design in Fusion don't need that kind of G3 connection so often. Um, and it's a pretty heavy computation it needs to do to achieve that smoothness. Um, so we don't offer it as a constraint today. There is a trick that if you're blending two straight lines, you can like align the control points in a way that guarantees that connection. But um, I wasn't going to show that because it's very specific to, to line segments. So really, it's more about eyeballing and getting it roughly right is what you should be aiming for. So yeah, use the minimum number of points to get the smoothest curves. Uh, I tend to use control point splines for those primary shapes and fit point splines for the transitions and more detailed shapes. And then for aesthetically, whoa, what happened? <laughs> um, and then for aesthetically smooth outputs, you want to go for G2, and you can try and approximate that G3 connection if possible. And again, really importantly is to avoid those zigzagging, because they can end up as visual inflections on the surface. OK, how am I doing for time? OK. Um, so we've talked about splines. Now we're going to build surfaces from those curves. So we have three primary surfacing tools in Fusion, not including the form tools, which I'll mention later. But this is going to focus on the the standard traditional surfacing tools that we have in Fusion. So sweep, loft, and patch. Um, we do get questions about like, people looking in competitive software and seeing like 20 surfacing tools versus R3. Uh, what we tried to do with Fusion was combine a bunch of functionality from different software. Well, different software would classify as different tools. We try and bundle that in and make it easier to use by having a simple set of tools and then having them expand to offer more advanced functionality as you change options and, and play with things. So that's why we have these three surface types in Fusion. So I'm going to start with sweeps. Um, so a sweep, the thing that makes a sweep a sweep is that it has a cro constant cross-section shape. So if we look at these two examples, we have a, a single profile and a path. And all the way along that sweep, it's going to hold a single cross-sectional shape. So this is the thing that, that classifies what a sweep is. Um, if I look at this example, so I have my profile and my path. Um, as it travels along the path, it's going to twist in multiple axes. And this is the thing that's kind of sometimes difficult to understand and control a sweep, is like how the sweep shape twists as it travels along the path. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit difficult to see, but it's, that path is traveling upwards and then going to the left. Um, and so that's the twist that's occurring in the shape. It's twisting upwards and then rotating to the left um, as it does that. 
So the way that I spoke to one of the developers who worked on the code for this, and the way he described it was um, thinking of the way an aircraft moves. So aircraft has three degrees of uh, rotation, right? It has yaw, has pitch, and it has roll. And you can think of a sweep kind of like a flight path. So as the profile travels along the uh, path of the sweep, that natural twisting that you'd get in the aircraft is how the sweep is going to twist around. So you can see in this example, it's flying straight in and flat to the ground. As it travels up the path, it's going to pitch upwards and roll to the left. And that's exactly what's happening with the profile here. Um, so you can look at this and think about how is my sweep twisting. It's going to be analogous to how an aircraft would tackle that flight path. So the, a lot of the controls and options we have in the sweep tool are designed to help you control and maintain the, the twisting that you have in the shape. So the most basic one we have is this orientation control. Uh, perpendicular is the default setting, which naturally flows that flight path. Um, if you set the orientation to parallel, it's going to hold any rotation, so it's not going to rotate the shape at all. So if we look at this example here, that's the example I had earlier on the left. And on the right, it's just everything is parallel to the original profile that I picked. We have a twist angle setting that lets you add kind of some manual roll into the shape. So you specify an angle, and it's applying that amount of twisting between the start and end of the sweep shape. So here I've got a 60 degree. It does a clockwise 60 degree twist on the shape. And that's from the start to the end. So depending on the length of your path, you might end up with a more dramatic twist versus the longer path. Another important note is that twisting occurs about kind of where the path is in relation to the profile. So you see if my path is at this corner, the twisting is going to happen around that corner. That's kind of like the center of rotation. Um, if I wanted it to be a uniform twist, I'd have to make sure that my path sits directly in the center of the profile. And then you can do some more dramatic things by having the, the path completely off there. For like super duper like control over your shape, um, we now offer this option of a guide surface, which is a very, it allows you to supply some geometry that very manually kind of controls how the shape is going to twist. And it controls all three degrees of those freedom. So it's kind of hard to, in words, describe how this works. But hopefully, this image kind of shows what's going on. Um, so there's our natural flight path. When you supply a guide surface, if you imagine kind of straight lines coming off perpendicular to that surface, that's going to hold where the cross sections of the profile um, sweep along the path. So here, it's kind of twisting unnaturally thanks to that. Um, this, is the cases, this is the kind of case where I find this really useful, is if it's twisting undesirably, and I want to say, hold it to the ground. So I want the profile to stay flat to the ground. Uh, I can use a flat guide surface on the floor. And that's going to keep my profile upright while allowing twisting in the other direction. Um, so it's hard to see that in an image. So I'm going to go and jump into Fusion and, and show that in 3D. Um, so this is the one. OK, so this is the example I just showed here. I'm going to do a sweep. Pick that profile. Oops. I just need a single, single path here. Pick that profile, pick that path. And OK, this is from an earlier dry run. <laughs> so by default, this is what you're going to get, is a perpendicular shape, which is, as we say, pitching upwards and rolling uh, to the left. So if we switch that to a parallel sweep, it's going to be perfectly parallel to the original profile that we had. It takes that shape and just maps it all the way along the sweep. Um, but if we want to like have rotation in one degree but hold it flat to the ground, the way we do that is with the guide surface option. So if I pick path with guide surface, now we need to actually select the guide surface input here. And you can see what that's doing now. So it's, it's not a, a parallel sweep, right? It's rotating along that path. But if I look at this cross section now, it's holding that edge flat to the ground. So for surface modeling, this can be a really useful technique to hold curves um, in a way that you expect. Uh, exactly, yeah, that's, that's a really good case. Like coil shapes as well. If, if you do a coil and it's twisting around the coil path, like this is a nice way to hold it flat to the ground, yeah. Um, so a few more options that we have in uh, Sweep. So we have the ability to, instead of a, have a guide surface, a guide rail. Um, and this uh, not only controls the twist, but also allows you to scale the shape. And this is kind of what I meant by multiple tools in one. So traditional surfacing software might have this idea of a bi-rail surface. So the way to achieve that infusion is to use the sweep command and supply both a, a path and a guide rail. And that's giving you that same kind of shape here. Um, we've had the question come up of how do I do a sweep with multiple profiles? Um, kind of in the fusion vernacular, if it has multiple profiles, it's not a sweep anymore. Um, but it is a loft. So what I recommend in these cases is if you do a loft and use a center line, um, the center line is 
kind of the loft with centerline is almost a mishmash of like the, part, the sweep command and the loft command. So it's using the same logic it would do for a sweep path um, along that centerline. It's uh, twisting the shape in the same way. So if you are using other tools and they're allowing you to do a, a sweep of multiple profiles, this is how you would do that in Fusion. Another important factor from a workflow perspective is that sweeps can't have G1 or G2 connectivity set with other surfaces you have. What this means is if you have swept shapes in your, your object, you should do those first of all and then build other surfaces off of those which allow you to, to build that connectivity. Um, in this case, those green surfaces are built with sweeps, but that red surface, there's no way to guarantee that's going to be a smooth connection. So you would lose a loft or another type of surface for that. Okay, so let me jump into Fusion again and show an example of some of those sweep options on a realistic example. So this is like a, I was just drawing whatever was around me when I was putting this together. So this is like an antiperspirant bottle. Um, and I've built those primary curves in already. So I'm gonna use these curves now to, to generate this shape. Um, I'll hide those canvases because I don't really need those now. Um, so yeah, I have a path here, I have a curve here. I actually had two curves set up, but they're so similar, this could be described as a sweep basically. So instead of using those two and building a loft between them, I'm just gonna sweep this one curve along the path down here. So I'll do a surface sweep, select that profile, I'll switch back to a single path. Select that path, and that's kind of the parallel result that I'm getting. So if I had that set to parallel, this is what I'd get, which is, as you'd expect, parallel to the original curve. If I do perpendicular, this is something that can be confusing sometimes, is how this sweep determines where it actually ends. Uh, the clue for this is if you take a look at the top view here, oops, um, Essentially, the sweep is gonna end perpendicular to where the path ends. Um, so if you look at the path, it's curving upwards in this area, and that's kind of a 90 degree angle there. So that's how it's determining where to cut off that, that, that sweep shape. Um, so if you didn't want that, if you wanted to, to match two curves that you had, that's where that guide rail option comes in. So I'm gonna change this to a guide rail sweep. Select that curve at the top there. And now it's matching those inputs nicely. Um, if you want to go for that kind of bi-rail shape like we have here, you want to make sure that the extent is set to full extents. Um, the default, I think, is perpendicular to path, which again is going to cut it off at that perpendicular angle. By setting this full extents, you can make sure that it travels to both ends of those curves. You can even like set these back if you wanted more fine control there. But in this case, going to the ends is what I want. Um, yeah, so it's a simple use case of where a sweep can come in handy. So I'll move on to the loft tool now. Um, so loft makes transitions between multiple profiles. So if you have multiple profiles you're transitioning between, it's, it's a loft um, it's a, as far as Fusion is concerned. Uh, these are some classic use cases of loft, right? So this is a traditional kind of four-sided patch that you'd do in traditional surface modeling. Um, this is kind of a classic case where you're lofting across multiple profiles. And loft also allows you to build nice blend surfaces. If you pick these two edges and loft between them, you can set a G1 or G2 constraint at those edges. So the thing to understand about what's going on with the loft is it's always creating a four-sided surface underneath. Um, you can think of that as like stretching a rectangular bit of material um, along the profiles that you set it. So the analogy that most comes to mind is like if you had a rectangular piece of tarp, it's like stretching that across whatever profiles you give it. Um, and that's helpful to understand when you're building lofts and sometimes they don't behave as expected. Uh, so, Maybe some audience participation here. Um, given these examples, does anyone have an idea which of these are good for loft and which ones are less good? Is uh, good? Yeah, that's right. So the first two are kind of classic loft examples where it works really well. So these can both be described as like rectangular pieces of material. So the left one is obvious. Um, loft is also good and you can like, having these circular profiles, it'll wrap itself around and build a rectangle that, that matches at an edge. and. Uh, we actually get a question of like, why does it have this seam here? It's because it's wrapping, essentially wrap, wrapping a rectangle around those inputs that you give it. The two on the left are, sorry, the two on the right are less good for loft. Um, the reason for that is like, you're taking that rectangular piece of tarp and you're like stretching it or pushing it in unnatural ways. Um, so you can see that triangle example, it's like scrunching up one of the edges to a point. Um, in this circular example, it's, I don't even know if you could build this, but if you could, it would end up like taking those corners and stretching them so that they were perfectly curved. Um, so when you're stretching and bending this rectangular piece of tarp in unnatural ways, that's gonna result in a loft that has problems. Um, 
The technical term for this is like singularities. So you can build these singularities into a loft shape by having the wrong kind of inputs, and that's gonna, you may be able to build the surface, but if you try and do stuff with it downstream, like offset it or work with the model, you may end up with unexpected failures. So really you wanna be going for shapes that can be described as a rectangle. Um, there is a way to analyze kind of the underlying structure of the surface. So um, if you right click a surface, and it's not a, it should be an analysis tool, but it's kind of hidden in the texture map controls. So if you right click a surface, um, open the texture map control, and set the display mode to this UV diagnostic texture. That's gonna show you the underlying direction of the surface, the U and V lines of the surface. Um, this is a really good technique to find, okay, if I'm having problems with the model, how do I understand that structure? Uh, yeah. Does that only exist for logs? Uh, no, it's any, any face on your model you can enable this tool. <laughs> We've been looking for this. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not intended for surface analysis, it's more for like texture mapping, so it's not 100% accurate, but it's a really good tool for doing this. Right, right, oh, okay, yeah, interesting, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's a really good, yeah, it's a really, it's a hidden gem in there that help analyze surfaces. Um, so I said that those singular points are bad. Here's a kind of exception to the rule, which is the loft tool can actually loft to a point. Um, so that is actually building a, a singularity at that point there, but it's, it's kind of a good singularity if there's such a thing. Um, so if you're building like a, a nice cone or a perfectly domed surface there, there is a singular point there, but it's, it's gonna behave a bit better than that triangle example that we showed there. Um, as I said, unlike a sweep, a loft can build these nice smooth transition between existing shapes. And um, something that I thought everyone knew, but then um, you ask people and they say, oh, how do you do this? So obviously it's not that discoverable. Um, there is a bit, the ability to control the weight of a G1 or G2 connection. So if I build this loft surface between these two edges, I can adjust this value at either edge and get either a sharper or a smoother transition between them. Okay, so I'll jump back into that model and show an example of a loft. Uh, so here I am, I lost that sketch at the bottom there, let me pull that back up. So this shape is transitioning between two very different shapes, right? You have a singular curve here and kind of more of a sine wave here. So this is the kind of case that's classic and perfect for a loft surface. Um, what I'm gonna do is, um, it's gonna be a sharp edge here, but I want it to be, if you can kind of tell what I'm doing here, I'm building half of the model, I'm gonna mirror, mirror it across to the other side. Um, so I wanna make sure that this loft flows G2 across that edge there. Um, with sweep, because sweep tends to be a more rigid surface, the fact that I made those curves at the top and bottom, G2 across that connection means that surface will be G2. But loft is a bit more flexible in how it describes shapes. So you need to give loft a bit of help to make sure that that edge is held with a smooth connection across the mirror plane. So the way that you typically do this in surface modeling is to build like a small ribbon surface that you can constrain to. So I'm gonna do an extrude of that edge there and just build a little tiny surface there. And instead of constraining to the curve, I'm gonna use that edge of that surface to make a nice smooth connection. So do a loft, pick those two profiles, and then I wanna make sure this is uh, G2 at that edge. This can stay G0 because that's a sharp corner there. Um, you can see this weight control here so I can adjust the amount of curvature there. Um, that's not really giving me the shape I want. You can see the edges are behaving funnily and I already have in mind the, the way I want this surface to flow. So instead of using that control, I'm gonna add some rails to this. So pick that top curve and the bottom curve as two rails. And there's my surface. And because I've constrained it G2 at that edge, I'm guaranteed that nice smooth connection across the mirror. So I can, like this surface is just a throwaway thing to construct that surface, so I can go and delete that now. And then I'm gonna go and mirror across that plane to um, give me the finished overall form. So select those two bodies, pick that as the mirror plane. Um, okay. And just to kind of validate that those are smooth, I'll throw on the zebra stripes quickly. So I've got that nice, I mean, it's a little bit wavy, it's not, I'm kind of doing this in a rush, but um, yeah, by tweaking the points, you can get a, a nice G, G2 connection there. That is G2, but um, you can probably tweak the curves a little bit to make it a bit more aesthetically pleasing. Um, okay, so I'll move on finally to the patch tool. Uh, so patch fits a surface through an arbitrary set of curves. Um, so those examples I showed that weren't so good for loft, they're actually perfect cases for the patch command things like a, a circular gap or a triangular space, or something like this. So if you have a five-sided hole that you need to fill with a surface, 
Uh, you can't really do this with a single loft because it's making four-sided shapes, but the patch tool can do this. Um, so we talked about lofts as being like a piece of tarp. Uh, I'm not gonna take credit for this analogy, but I had a product manager I used to work with on an inventor called Pete Lord, um, and he described the patch tool as the spackle tool. Um, I didn't know what he meant because we call this like polyfiller in the UK, but uh, um, basically his, his, his mindset was like, you have a hole in your shape and you just like throw some stuff in there and it makes a surface that fills the hole. Um, and that's not an inaccurate way to describe how the patch tool works. And actually this image on the left, oh sorry, the image on the right gives a nice indication of how patch is working behind the scenes. Um, so taking that triangular example again, um, we talked about how loft builds that, kind of scrunches that corner of the piece of tarp together. The patch, the way patch works is it takes your curves and it builds a rectangular surface um, through those curves and then trims it to the edges that you specified. So um, a lot of the faces on your model, um, as well as the visible face that you see, there may be a surface underlying that surface that extends beyond the face that's visible. That's what the patch tool is doing. It's building a rectangular piece of material and then trimming it to the edges that you give it. Um, so in this case, it's gonna build a shape that's a lot more robust. Those singular points can cause problems for things like offsets, whereas in this patch case, that rectangle is gonna offset nicely and give you um, more robust uh, model geometry. And again, using that analysis tool that we talked about, we we're able to see the underlying structure and tell the difference between those two surface types. So, it looks like patch is like a tool that can just surface anything. Um, oh, sorry, question. I knew someone was gonna ask that, sorry. You can't do that today. Um, we've talked about it, it would be a nice tool to have, but yeah, unfortunately, untrim isn't available. Uh, there are some workarounds sometimes to get the extended surface, but uh, yeah, unfortunately not. Um, so yeah, patch seems to work on any inputs you give it. Um, the downside is that it isn't paying so much attention to the flow of the shape that you're giving it. So if you have four-sided inputs, loft is pretty much always gonna give you a better quality result. So here's a classic example of that. Um, I have this hole that I need to fill. If I use a loft, um, it's taking those edges and it's building a surface that matches the curvature of those edges. So it's building a nice shape with uh, underlying geometry that matches the flow of the surface. So I'm gonna get a nice smooth transition across that uh, curve there. If I do a patch on that same thing, it's basically just throwing a bit of saran wrap over the top. It's not really building a surface that matches the input so cleanly. Um, so this will build a shape that kind of looks about right, but underneath, those uh, underlying UV lines in the surface are not mapping to the way the, the, surface, actually, <clears throat> sorry, the surface actually flows, and that's gonna mean the shape isn't, you know, you're gonna end up with funny bumps and lumps probably in that surface, whereas loft is gonna give you a nice, clean, smooth transition there. So for four-sided inputs, lofts are generally better. Okay, so let me jump quick, quickly back into that model and show uh, how a patch works here. So up top now I have a, have four edges, but it's not really a four-sided input because there's smooth connections here. So this is more like a two-sided surface. So I could, let me turn those zebra stripes off. Um, I could loft between those. So I pick those two edges. If I, little trick with loft is that if you pick edges that are connected, it's gonna continue appending to that first profile. If I wanna declare, okay, I want the next selection I make to be a separate profile, I need to hit that plus button here. And that's saying, okay, leave that profile as it is and then start a new one. So pick those two now. And that's lofted between these two sets of curves. Um, that looks okay, but then if we go and do that trick, so select the surface, right click it, go into the texture map control, and set the display mode to that UV diagnostic. We can see that underneath, this is all scrunching up in those two corners. It's taking that rectangular piece of material and stretching it in an unnatural way. And this is, again, the surface may look okay, but the underlying geometry is not good, and this may cause failures downstream. So this is a perfect example where patch can come in useful. So I'll undo that loft. Um, just throw a patch surface in there. One, two, three, four. And do the same thing. You can see this is now a kind of a rectangle that's been overbuilt and then trimmed to those edges. So I'm getting nice, clean, rectilinear underlying geometry there that's gonna be a lot more robust when I model with this downstream. Okay, oh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's 
Fillet's a good example of where those singular points will really cause problems. It will like try and fillet that corner and it will probably encounter problems. Whereas if there's a nice, as you say, like a nice overlap, fillet has a better time of, uh, of dealing with that kind of geometry. So yeah, it's like overbuild. It's essentially the same as overbuilding a surface and trimming it. Um, if you're able to do that yourself, like build a sweep or a loft and overbuild, that geometry is actually probably gonna be a bit better because it's, you have more control over the shape. Patch is like just fitting a surface through those curves as best it can. Um, that can result in geometry that's a bit more complex in terms of like the number of control points underneath versus a loft or a sweep. So if you wanna overbuild, that's probably gonna result in better results. But patch is like a, you have a hole on the shape, you need to fill, patch tool can do it. Um, yeah, so planes, tops, and uh, spackle. <laughs> um, so these are the three surface types. As I say, like thinking of them in these terms can help understand what's going on underneath and help understand when to use each of these types. So a sweep, again, is a constant section shape, good for primary curves, uh, sorry, primary surfaces, because you can't transition um, from them to other shapes smoothly. Loft is kind of the power horse of uh, surfacing, so it's good for four-sided surfaces and you can build those transitions into them. And then patch is, if you have situations that can't be resolved with a sweep or loft, then you can use patch. But I would recommend using that sparingly because you have less control over that shape. Um, and the flatter the area that you put it, the, the more likely you're gonna have a, a nicer, cleaner result. Okay, so finish on like how to bring this together and um, follow some strategy. I'm okay, I'll, uh, I'll kind of rush through this a bit. Um, so yeah, if you're building a surface model, you need to think about, okay, where do I put my curves and surfaces in order to describe this shape? Um, so using what we've just learned about sweeps and lofts and patches, uh, the way I would typically approach um, a shape description is to look for constant section shapes, first of all, um, and then use sweeps to define those, because sweeps are nice, clean, kind of rigid types of surface. Then use lofts to build those transitions and things that can't be described as sweeps. And then finally, if you need to kind of fill in areas of the model, Try and keep those on flatter regions and you can use a patch to fill those gaps in. So let's take a, an actual example of this. So we have this um, set of headphones and there's an interesting surfacing challenge here of having this single headband transition into this smooth ear cup region here. So firstly, I'm looking for sweeps. So this top section here is like a nice constant section area. And around here, we have a nice constant section kind of portion of this ear cup as well. So I can start by just defining those as sweeps and then try to tackle this bit in the middle here. So I can use, um, because this is symmetric, I can just cut that in half and tackle this one half at a time and then mirror res the results across. Um, so I'm gonna build a, a curve there and then think about this five-sided region here. What can I do to fill this with nice clean surfaces? One way to do this is to split that five-sided region into two four-sided portions. So you can use the loft tool for that. So this is one configuration that would work there. Um, but knowing how loft works and knowing that there's gonna be two rectangles here like this, um, I can start to think about, well, what's the underlying structure of that surface gonna be? And you can see that, okay, those lines are gonna flow smoothly into each other in this area, but they're gonna transition into this hard, sharp corner here. And so that's gonna result in something that may be visible as a sharp edge on the model. So this configuration may not be the smoothest that I can get. What I really want is a surface that flows from that headband into that region there. So again, having a loft that kind of matches that shape is the way to achieve that kind of smoothness and guarantee that high quality surface. Uh, that leaves me with this kind of triangular region here that I could put a patch in. Um, I know that having this kind of knife edge here is gonna cause problems even for patch because if those edges are slightly misaligned, the surface is gonna do kind of crazy things there. Um, so what I recommend in this case is if you have those knife edges, you can think about maybe pulling the surface away. So here I'm flowing with a loft along this portion of the surface, but then pulling that back a little bit, trimming that surface, and giving myself a five-sided region here that's a lot easier to patch. And because it's kind of a flat area, the patch should give me a satisfactory result here. Um, so let's have like one minute. <laughs> I'll quickly dive into Fusion and, and show how to actually do that in practice. Um, so I've built um, the start of that shape here. So these are my sweeps, you can see I've used a sweep to build that ear cup and trimmed away this portion that isn't really a, a regular sweep. And then I've used a sweep for that portion up there, just with a single profile and a path. Um, I've done a bit of trimming as well, and I've built some initial curves here to describe those shapes. 
So I could like, it's a five-sided region, I could put a patch in there, but as we saw, like patch isn't guaranteed to follow that flow, that curvature in a nice way. So really what I wanna do is build a loft there. So I'm gonna start by um, building a, a curve that blends these two together and build a four-sided region that I can loft. So um, I'm building a curve in 3D. If you're doing that, it doesn't really matter which plane you pick to start the sketch on. I'm just gonna pick this plane here, but the curve is actually gonna be tied to these two edges. I'll do the same as I did before. Fit point spline with two points. Apply a curvature constraint between those two edges. And that's looking pretty good already. Um, I could go and tweak those handles if I wanted to adjust that shape. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just finish there and then go and build a loft um, using those four inputs. That should give me a nice surface. So those are the two profiles and I'm gonna pick those two curves as rails. That loft is naturally flowing, as you remember, those lines of that top are flowing in that natural direction of those four curves that I gave it. So that's gonna be a nice smooth transition there. Um, actually, I didn't even set the conditions, so let me go back. Um, those two edges, as I said, I can apply G2 constraints to those to ensure that there's a smooth connection there. And I can go in and validate that with the zebra analysis tool here. So let me pull this down a bit. Um, yeah. So that surface is flowing in a nice even direction and is matching the, the user intent in that case. Let me turn that off for now. Um, so as I said, this kind of triangle region here is gonna be bad to surface, no matter what you do. So what I'm gonna do is kind of cut this surface away a little bit and give myself a bit more room to put a nice surface in there. So I'm gonna create a new sketch on this plane. I'll just project, I just wanna build a curve here that I can trim with. So I'm gonna project that edge that is built onto this plane can't really see it, but there it is. Um, I'll use the offset tool to create an offset of that, give me a few, like maybe four or five mil that I can trim off. Then I'll just use the surface trim tool to, to cut that portion away. So trim, pick that edge, pick that region to cut away, and there we go. Um, so now this five-sided region is an area that's pretty flat, and I can't really do a loft through here, but a patch will probably be okay because it's a very flat and regular shaped region. Oh, sorry, I thought someone asked a question. Um, okay, so let me do, go ahead and do that. So patch, um, pick these. Okay, so another trick here is that I don't have an edge to select here um, because I haven't, these are still two separate bodies. So the way to deal with that is to use the stitch tool. So by stitching one, two, three together, I've kind of told it that these two are connected and there's like a short edge here rather than two longer edges. So if I hit okay now, there's edges here now that I can pick for my patch. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. One, two, three, four, and five. That's made a patch surface. I want this to run smoothly with the other geometry. Um, so a little trick here is like, I could go through and adjust all these to G2, but if I group the edges, I can apply a single constraint to all of those edges. So let's say G2 here now. Um, you can see that it's getting a bit funny here, and that's because this should be a sharp edge here. This is flowing sharp in this region but I'm saying I want it to be G2 here, so that's causing the patch to wobble a bit. So if I ungroup those and go and find that edge in my table, I can just set that to G0, and that's gonna give me a much smoother result. Um, yeah, and if we throw the zebra stripes on there, we can see that that patch is, um, there's some kind of waviness there. I think that's, that's not a problem with the surface. Really, you should be looking at the flow of the lines and making sure that they're smooth, and it's giving me a nice even flow across that surface. That, yeah, that's a bit, it <laughs> doesn't look so good, but what's really happening there is I think it's just the, the graphics of the surface is not um, uh, refined enough. So um, this high quality option should be fixing that. I'm not sure why it's going on there, but uh, if you're looking at the direction of the curves and making sure that they're flowing evenly, that's giving you a good indication that that's a good quality surface. Um, okay, quickly, um, don't just use surface traditional surfacing techniques. Um, you know, I think coming from a, another software where it's just surfacing tools, you can think that you have to build each patch individually. But the power of fusion is that we can have solids and surfaces and T-splines all combined into one single object. So here I'm building this shape. Rather than describing all of these surfaces individually, I can build a, a solid shape that kind of roughly represents that shape and then use a few different types of surfaces to, to cut away from that shape and, and more quickly achieve a result than could be achieved by doing all of those patches individually. So I didn't talk about it in this topic. This is a whole separate conversation, but um, you can combine surfaces and solids together to build more efficient workflows for building shapes.